morning, thankful to uh, be able to stand here with you and open God's Word. It's always a joy and a privilege to do that. And so uh, this morning is different. We, uh, there we go. Even I can hear a little bit there. All right. No different. Uh, the privilege of being able to open God's Word with you today is a great one, and I don't take that lightly. So I pray that God will use His Word uh, in our lives this morning, and I want us all to pray that together. So as is our custom, we are going to uh, spend one minute silently uh, praying in God's Word. I know it's um, for some uh, one, one minute silent, we don't do that a lot, and so it, it almost seems like an eternity, but it's an opportunity for us. But today we're going to be looking at uh, how God's kingdom, uh, in, in one sense, one aspect of how God's kingdom grows, how it transforms. And uh, that goes beyond, as I'll say at one point in the sermon, that goes beyond what happens in this local church. And so there are uh, countless uh, other pastors in other places, both in locally here and in, uh, beyond, who are bringing God's Word to uh, people today uh, to strengthen the saints, and um, God can use it also to, uh, to save people who don't know Christ. And so I pray, I, I want us to pray this morning during this time of um, one minute of silence, um, pray, for some, pray for other churches. Uh, other churches come to mind uh, in our area uh, where you know they believe the Bible, they're preaching God's Word, they preach the Gospel. Pray that God would empower uh, those pastors uh, to, to faithfully, passionately, um, accurately bring God's Word to, to God's people. So pray that this morning, and then I'll close us and jump into the sermon. Our Father, it is your kindness that has allowed us to gather here this morning and open your word so freely. But we know that we're not the only ones all across your world and uh, even, even in our own uh, town, in our own county, there are others who are opening your word now or will be in short order and bringing it to your people. So, Lord, we thank you for that, and we pray that as your word is preached today, that you would empower your servants to bring it, and that it would make a kingdom impact as your word penetrates the hardened human heart by your spirit. Lord, would you do a powerful work, and even in this place, as we open your word this morning, we do pray, we plead with you to open our, our thoughts, our minds, to receive what it is you have to say to us. Humble us, Lord, that we might receive... Uh, from you, what it is you're trying to say here in, uh, in these two parables. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Junior high is a time when uh, young people, or most young people anyway, grow and change significantly. There's a lot of changes that take place in those years. Um, I hit a really big growth spurt when I was in eighth grade and uh, grew pretty significantly. I don't know how many inches it was, but I would say uh, by the time I was in ninth grade, I was full height what I am right now. And I remember specifically one instance when I was in eighth grade, my clothes didn't fit anymore from seventh grade. And I guess that fact was lost on me. And I remember my, my peers were so kind to point out to me. Uh, I, I remember getting asked the question numerous times, you going fishing today? Because my, my pants were too short. They were way up or whatever it was just uh 
the cruelty that kids can have for, for uh, one another sometimes is kind of humorous. But anyway, uh, that's a time of growth and change for most people. I would say the majority of us, if we polled us uh, in this room, most people probably hit their growth spurt somewhere in those junior high years. However, there are folks who don't hit a, a growth spurt like that until later, maybe high school or even college. I know that does happen. I knew a kid like that when I was in high school. He was a couple years behind me. I was a, a, a senior in high school, and he was a sophomore, and he came and he joined our junior ROTC unit that I was a part of. Um, I, I'm not trying to be cute in saying this. I'm, I mean this. I don't even know if they had a uniform that fit this guy. Um, he was really small, um, and he just hadn't hit his growth spurt yet, so he looked like he was several years younger than he was. Um, without a doubt, this guy was the smallest, the smallest uh, person I knew or smallest boy that I knew in high school. Well, I didn't see this guy again for several years, at least three or four uh, after I graduated. And then uh, when I was late in my college years, maybe even around the time I graduated, uh, so it would have been roughly four years later, I was a part of a large uh, college and singles ministry. I had come to faith in Christ when I was 20, and I was a part of this large college and singles ministry at the church I, I was at there. And we used to draw a lot of visitors to our, our weekly gathering, which was ironically called The Gathering. Uh, so we had our Thursday night gathering for college and singles, and I played bass guitar in the, uh, in the worship band. At the end of the evening, after the preaching time, we would have kind of a time of fellowship. They'd have snacks and whatnot, and we'd just mingle with people. There were visitors, you'd meet people and whatnot. And I remember this one particular night, this young man came up and, and uh, introduced himself to me, but it turns out that he was actually the guy from high school that they couldn't find a uniform that would fit him. And now he was not even just my height. He, was, he had to have been well over six feet tall, uh, dramatic change, uh, clearly had matured in a ton, ton of ways. I, honestly, I don't even really remember much of what we talked about that night. We caught up for a few minutes. It had been time since I'd seen him. But the thing that stuck most with me was just the amazing transformation that had occurred. How did this guy that was probably this height when I was in high school, now he turns out he's like this. How, how does that happen? It's just surprising. Uh, he had grown up in a major way. And it was stunning. Well, our passage today in Luke's Gospel in chapter 13 contains two parables from the mouth of the Lord Jesus. You remember, a parable is a story with a point. Uh, he's telling a story, but it has a point to it. And so there's two parables, very short parables, back to back today. And Jesus would use parables frequently in the course of his earthly ministry to teach a particular lesson, usually regarding the kingdom of God. And so that is what the parables in today's passage deal with, the kingdom of God and its transformation. And like the young man that I mentioned uh, just a bit ago, the, the transformation uh, of God's kingdom, the growth that's experienced by it is both surprising and amazing. So as we examine this morning's passage, we're going to ask and answer two questions. Uh, I've got Question one, and then later I'll have question two, and there's multiple answers to each question. So the first question I want us to ask this morning is this, how is the growth of God's kingdom surprising? How? If I'm going to make that statement that it's surprising, what can we learn from these two parables, these two short little stories, what can we learn from this about how the growth of God's kingdom is surprising? The first answer is this, Unimpressive beginnings yield an impressive end. Unimpressive beginnings yield an impressive end. The timing of this passage as we're working through Luke isn't entirely clear. We know that Luke has a tendency sometimes to group things by theme. There is a rough chronology, as I've said before, and so we can assume that this was probably later in Jesus' earthly ministry. He's, he's on this meandering course towards Jerusalem, although if we recognize that these parables are found in another form uh, in Matthew and Mark, it's also quite possible that Jesus had used these parables as teaching moments multiple times in the course of his ministry. That's quite possible. 
Now, I want us to look for a moment as we begin to dive into these verses. I want us to look uh, at the, the stark contrast between these unimpressive beginnings and the impressive end. So let's first of all consider the parable of the mustard seed. He says, what is the kingdom of God like, in verse 18, and to what shall I compare it? It is like a mustard seed which a man took and threw into his own garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air nested in its branches. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I'm an expert on plants and trees. Uh, I've shared with you before, uh, it's irritating to me sometimes when pastors come up and they act like they're experts on everything. I don't know much about trees. I don't know a lot about plants, far from it. And apparently there are numerous different species of mustard plants. So what I'm about to tell you is pretty general from my research. However, when I researched it, here's what I learned. The mustard seed in its various varieties is quite small, right? We're we're not talking about an acorn here or something like that, a pine cone or something. This is a, a, a fairly small seed. It's not microscopic, But as seeds go, it's one of the smaller ones. And yet what this tiny seed produces is disproportionately large in comparison. So small seed, you would think maybe very small plant, but it's disproportionate uh, in the the growth that it experiences. And you think about garden plants. Some of you, how many of you plant a garden? How many of you guys have a garden? Several of you have a garden. That's cool. I, I, I love it, actually. Uh, It's great that many folks have gardens. Uh, When you think about garden plants, a number of them grow close to the ground, right? They they just kind of come up a little bit or whatever, and and they grow close to the ground. I I imagine the birds of the air don't nest in, say, strawberry plants, right? How many of you picked strawberries before? Did you pick them from a strawberry tree, right? You go up to the strawberry tree and you pick, no, no, they're on, they're on the ground, at least the ones that we had in Florida, they were on the ground, right? You just pick them off the ground. Pretty sure the birds of the air don't nest in those. And the birds of the air probably don't nest in a watermelon patch. Again, anything that grows in gardens on the ground, typically that's not going to happen. However, that little mustard seed grows, in, it's really more like a shrub apparently, but it can grow into like, you know, roughly a small tree, maybe several feet in height. Um, large enough that the birds of the air could, if they desired, take shade in its branches. They could take shelter there. We're not talking about a redwood tree here. This isn't some giant sequoia, but again, disproportionate to the size of the seed, not what you would expect anyway. Impressive, considering the size of the seed, what actually grows out of it. Now, the parable of the leaven, or or we usually think in terms of yeast, uh, is, is similar in its meaning. Verse 20 says, uh, To what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now here, a relatively small amount of leaven or yeast is placed within a very large quantity of flour. The New American Standard, which Pastor Mark read from, which I'm preaching from, translates that as three pecks of flour. That doesn't really... I mean, I remember the song what is it, Some I love you, a bushel in a peck, a bushel in a peck. I'm not going to sing it. I, I remember that, but I don't know what quantity of measure that is. Now, if you have the New International Version, uh, it says something like uh, 60 pounds of flour. In other words, this is a pretty significant amount of flour that's there. And there's a relatively small amount proportionally of leaven that goes into that, uh, and it leavens the whole lump. Let me paraphrase the meaning by quoting something from the Apostle Paul. Uh, I don't have this on the screens, but in 1 Corinthians 5, which I'll reference later, Paul says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? In other words, you don't need a ton of it, right? It's not like you have equal proportions of flour and yeast or leaven. You, 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 how many of you guys break, bake bread? Uh, several do, right? You don't have equal proportions, 60 pounds of flour and 60 pounds of... I don't even know what would happen. Uh, that, that would not be normal. You don't do that. A small amount, you don't need a ton of it, Work gets worked into the dough, and then it causes it to rise so that it can be baked into bread. And so again, you have something very small, that is the leaven, causing something to be quite large and impressive in the end. Uh, the risen dough, which is also tasty once it's baked. And so again, you have something unimpressive resulting in something impressive. Now let's 
take those two parallel parables and consider what Jesus is saying. He's saying that the kingdom of God is like those things. A tiny mustard seed growing into a tree and a small amount of leaven that will ultimately cause the dough to rise into this impressive uh, uh, large quantity of bread. Unimpressive beginnings, but the end result is pretty impressive when you consider how things started, my friends. Is this not what we see if we examine the Scriptures into the history of Christianity? Is that not what we see? Think about what we've seen in Luke's Gospel. When Jesus went about choosing those 12 disciples that would become his apostles, the leaders of the early church, he went to all the best schools in the land, all the best uh, religious schools in the land. He scoured, he asked for uh, GPAs. He was like, what's their grade point average? What kind of test scores did they have? What was their aptitude for spiritual matters? He went to all these different places to find the best and the brightest, and those are the folks that he selected as his apostles. Absolutely not. That is not at all what he did. If you're familiar, you read the the book of Luke, you read the Gospels, that is not what he did at all. It almost seems like he picked the least likely people that he was, okay, let's, uh, you know what, let's get some fishermen. That would be good. Fishermen would make good. Let's get, uh, so we got 12 slots to to pull these uh, guys that are going to lead the early church. Let's, let's find some fishermen. You know what? Out of the 12, let's get like four of them that are fishermen. What? And then let's find this guy that's a, a tax collector because everybody loves tax collectors, even today, right? You love your tax collector. I know you do, right? Let, let's find a guy who's a tax collector. In the Scriptures in the New Testament, they get lumped in with that group of sinners, right? tax collectors and sinners, right? That They get lumped together. So that hated guy, let's find that guy, Levi or Matthew, let's call him out and bring him on board. And then we'll, we'll get a zealot in there as well who would hate tax collectors. We'll, we'll pull all these folks together and then those are the guys who are going to lead the church. That sounds like a recipe for disaster except for the fact that God can do what He pleases. And God does that on purpose. Jesus knew what he was doing. I I was being sarcastic. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. When he chose those specific fellas to be his his, uh, original disciples, his apostles, he pulled those together. The, The likelihood, so to speak, of success from a worldly perspective would be quite small. But there's, a, a, there, there's one little thing, not little, is it? Big God takes these guys and says, okay, fellas. And actually, one of them turned out to be a, 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 a traitor, right? So you actually only have 11 out of the original 12. Those guys God's going to use to shake the world. He's going to send them out. More and more people are going to come to faith. Within a few centuries, Christianity had spread throughout much of the world. And how did it spread? Mostly through unnamed people from our perspective. Right? We can look back in the Scriptures and we see people like Paul, Apollos, whatever. And if you're a student of church history, you could go through and you could name some specific people. But by and large, the way that Christianity spread was through average people. Just everyday people. Uh, moms and dads and brothers and sisters and workers and this and that, men, women, and children just living faithfully for Jesus, sharing the truth that Jesus Christ died for sinners. Names lost in history, but they are known to the God who saved them. And they are doing what God called them to do, and that is what God is using to build His kingdom. Unimpressive beginnings for sure, impressive end. That is how God works, my friends, and it's taken shape that way throughout the history of the church. Now there's another, I want us to go back to that original question for a minute. How is the growth of God's kingdom surprising? Well, if we look at these parables a bit more, we can answer it. There's another kind of thing that we can add to the answer there. And that is this, that the growth is usually neither immediate nor dramatic. It's neither immediate 
nor dramatic. Now, I told you I'm not a plant expert. I tried to look up how long does it take for a mustard seed to grow into a mature plant. You see different things online. Apparently, it's one of the faster growing seeds, but that's a relative statement. How ridiculous would it be if this, this guy threw the seed into his garden, he casts it out in there, he's got his mustard seed out there, and then he goes to bed, and the next morning he goes out to his garden, and he's like, man, where's the tree? This must be defective seed. I knew they were, they, I knew they were uh, selling me bad seed over there. That's not right. Where's my tree? That's not how it works. It doesn't work that way at all. And so, in a, in a relative sense, again, I, I realize we're not talking giant sequoias here, but it's not overnight. It would be absurd for someone to think that. If the guy thinks that way, it's a defect in his thinking, not in the plant, because it takes time for it to grow. The growth isn't immediate. Day by day, the growth comes. Or think about it this way. He's like, all right, I get it. Didn't grow the first day. Gets a chair and just sets it out there by his garden. We're watching the mustard seed grow. And when's this thing going to get started? It'll take a while, isn't it? Like watching paint dry. It's about how exciting it would be. It's not happening. It's, it's, it's slow. It's, it's, uh, it's not immediate. It's not dramatic. And the same is true for leaven. Now, obviously, when we're talking about bread rising. We're not talking about you know, uh, weeks, months, years. We're talking about minutes or hours, most likely. But again, it's not an immediate process. We're not talking about something that happens right away. You know, if the, how, how absurd would it be? Same thing if the woman takes the, she, it says that the woman was working through the, the leaven into the flour. She's working that into the dough or whatever. And then she's like, all right, uh, I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee. I don't know if they had coffee in that day or whatever. But hey, in our story, she's got the coffee, right? So she goes, grabs a cup of coffee. She comes back and she's like, oh. Defective yeast, leaven's bad. How come it's not risen? What's going on here? That is not how it works, right? It's a slow process. It does work, but you've got to give it time. And eventually, it grows up into something. Patience is required. The end result is good, but it's not going to be lightning fast. It's not like throwing something in the microwave and it just boom. It wasn't like that. Now, we start thinking about how the kingdom of God is like the illustrations uh, that are used in these parables. I could see someone objecting immediately. Yeah, but what about the book of Acts? What about Pentecost? Wasn't that immediate and dramatic? Well, yeah, it was. One sermon and thousands of people come to faith. That's awesome. And what about the great awakenings, revivals in the history of the church? Yeah, what about those things? Well, they were certainly dramatic, and there were apparently immediate results however i will caution you on that as someone who came to faith in christ at a billy graham crusade i can tell you that god was working for a long time prior to that point so even in those those things that we think of usually it's not like that my friends when we think about things like pentecost and the immediate dramatic you know kind of explosion of faith among people and whatnot that, that, that's the exception it's not the rule right it's wonderful Kingdom growth is often slow and quite undramatic. In saying that, I'm not discounting the miracle of salvation. When a sinner, when a, when a, a sinful person like you or like me humbles himself or herself and comes to faith in Jesus, that is a miracle every single time. So I'm not discounting that. I'm not saying that's not miraculous. Of course it is. There's something dramatic about that. But my point is that we don't often see large-scale, uh, dramatic conversions of people. It does happen, but rather, usually what we see is an individual here, a small group of people there, and so on. That's usually the pattern of how God's wor God works. We even see it way earlier in Scripture from the, the passage that Pastor Mark read earlier with Abraham. Like God says, I want you to leave your family, Genesis 12, and I want you to go to this land, and I'm going to make you into a great nation, and this is going to happen. All right, let's do it. And so Abraham gets up, and he goes, and 
uh, within nine months, his wife has a baby, and then next thing you know, they're all multiplying, and it's a great nation. No, that's not what happens. Right? Even in Abraham's lifetime, Abram, later Abraham, it takes decades for things to unfold to the point where he's like, uh, we're getting kind of old. I don't know where we're going to be able to have this, you know, wh- where's this nation going to come from? Like, I'm kind of getting up there in years. I don't know how this is going to work. Eventually, God does answer, and he has Isaac, but at the time of his death, if Isaac is the, the kind of the chosen one, I would hardly call one person a great nation. And so God unfolds this plan over centuries, centuries. That's how things often work. It's, it's the way that God works. And quite often, as I said a moment ago, it takes, an, it takes a considerable amount of time for a gospel seed to take root and grow in a person's life. Right? I, I mentioned I came to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade. However, I can look back and say, okay, it was more than two years prior to that that I received a gift of a Bible and began to read that consistently. And actually, the Lord was working in other ways prior to that. And so this took time. It wasn't some immediate thing. God was working over a period of time. But too often, we're on the hunt for quick fixes that will supposedly produce dramatic church growth in no time at all. I I can't tell you how many things I get, either we get by phone or I get in the mail uh, at the church. If you will just They'll give you a Pentecost type experience at your church if you will just buy these magic beans. Just buy the magic beans, and boy, they're going to grow like Jack and the Beanstalk, right? You remember the story from when you were a kid? You throw the magic beans, and boom. So if you'll just buy this program, if you'll just do this, boy, the growth's just going to come and it's going to spring up, and you're going to be amazed at what happens if you just will pull this lever and buy these magic beans. There are no magic beans. There is the Spirit of God, and of course He's capable of doing that, but there's no magic beans. There's no like, hey, I haven't seen it. Maybe you got the magic beans. I don't know. I don't think so. That's a fairy tale. It's not reality. Kingdom growth can and does occur, and we should absolutely desire it, but quite often it's slow. It's not dramatic. We should also remember that God's at work all over the place, right? The church, I've I've wrestled with this this morning when Melinda read my sermon. She asked me about this, and we talked a bit about the church in the kingdom. How do you relate the church in the kingdom? Man, we're going to be here for like a long time if we're going to talk about that in detail. Let me just simply say the church is necessary. It's a part of God's plan but in the end, God's at work in other places, uh, other churches. He's, he's creating a people for himself. And so the kingdom is bigger than the church. Again, that's another topic for another time. But my point is this. We can celebrate it when we hear God doing amazing things in other places. And we pray for that here. But if that's not happening, it doesn't mean that God's not at work. God is at work, friends. We can't manufacture it. Kingdom growth often isn't immediate, nor is it dramatic, but it can happen in God's timing. That says something about patience. We're not a patient people. right? We, we, are, the, we are the people in a larger sense that created the microwave. right? We created the microwave. Why? So you could have some soggy pizza in 30 seconds when you reheated it. Or you could... Heat up your coffee immediately. That, that, that's the mindset that we have. But friends, it's just not the way that God works a lot of times. Now, I'm going to come back to that, that theme in just a bit about patience. But I want us to, to give one more answer to that question. How is the growth of God's kingdom surprising? We look at our text. Its growth ultimately occurs by unseen forces and processes unseen forces and processes it's interesting same thing with the plants as it is with bread dough rising it's ultimately caused by unseen forces and processes not by the agency of human beings yes the seed needs to be planted it needs to be watered 
the leaven needs to be worked into the dough. But the growth takes place seemingly on its own if you're observing it with the naked eye, right? I, I recognize scientifically someone would say, well, actually what's going on there is uh, photosynthesis and this and that. I, I get that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about with the naked eye, if I'm looking at a, a, a loaf of, uh, a, a lump of dough with yeast in it, it looks magical, right? It's like, whoa, how's that growing? It just grow. I mean, I, you're not going to not see it in real time like that, but over time you're going to see that. Same thing with the tree. It's just growing, right? It just happens. God makes it grow. I know it's not magical, and I know there's scientific explanations for it, but the point is that God is the one making it grow. My friends, the kingdom of God is much like this. It's not some unseen spiritual force like Star Wars, the force makes it grow. It's not like that. The Holy Spirit is the one uh, that does that. God grows his kingdom. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul's talking about a situation there in the church at Corinth in the first century. He says, what then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. It is important what they were doing. We are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. It is important what they were doing. However, the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary, the greatest theologian, the author of much of the New Testament, he literally just called himself nothing. I'm nothing. Why? Because God's everything. God is the one who made it grow. Unseen forces, right? Well, God is the one who's doing that. The same is true today. For all our plans and our strategies, all our efforts to see God's kingdom grow, it's all in vain unless God causes the growth. Period. He is the one. He's the one who does it. And when it does grow, God must be the one who gets the credit. That's what Paul is saying. Yeah, I, I did that. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was the one that made it grow. I'm nothing. That's what Paul is saying. My friends, we can manufacture excitement with gimmicks and we could draw a crowd, but that's not genuine. It may grow things superficially, but it doesn't grow the kingdom because are people actually becoming citizens of the kingdom? Are they genuinely coming to faith in Christ because of gimmicks, right? If we could entertain people, we have the laser light show. And we're gonna, this morning in God's word, this is what we're going to do, smoke. And people say, well, did you hear that, man? Over Rikers Ridge, they got the awesome smoke machine. It's lights and mirrors, and you would never believe it. it's like pyrotechnics inside the building. And we pack this thing out. Are people actually coming to faith? I'm not the one who, first one who said it. What we win them with, we win them too. And so then when the next guy up the block says, hey, man, that really works. If we got the laser light show and we give out popsicles... Oh, we can one-up them, and they're all going to come over here. So let's do that. Let's have the laser light show and the popsicles until the next guy says, you know what, we're going to have popcorn too. And this guy over here says, hey, we're grilling steaks, baby. And it, it just becomes one-upmanship. I might think about it. That's another story for another time. I remember, I remember that at Christmas one time. I, I was associate pastor at another church, and one of the other churches, sister churches in town, was doing something like that at Christmas time. And they had some awesome stuff they were giving out. I told our senior pastor, I'm not coming here on Christmas Eve, I'm going over there. I didn't do that. My friend, I'm not saying that all that stuff is horrible, it's sinful, it's wrong. I'm just saying we got to be careful. If people are coming to be entertained, or are they coming to hear the life transforming gospel of Jesus Christ? Right? Why are we here? We are here to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. We are here to hear from the God who created the heavens and the earth, who has spoken. We are here to praise His name. That's why we're here. 
Now, styles vary in places, I get that. Personalities vary, all that kind of stuff. But we're not here to entertain people, right? We are, we are here to challenge people that there is a holy God who's offended by their sin and help them to see their need for a Savior and see that there is a Savior, that that same God who takes sin so seriously that he, 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 it required a, a death, a sacrifice of His own Son, that God gave because He loved. That's hope, friends. It's, it's, a lot, it's not a lot of hope in this world, is there? Right? The world's a pretty bleak place. It's a hard place to live in. But my friends, we hold out hope for people when we hold out the gospel of Jesus Christ. That a holy, righteous God loves sinners to the extent that He would willingly give His own Son for me, for you. That's what we hold out. My friends, there's life in that. Life. Life. Sometimes the dramatic pause actually has a purpose. Other times you just forgot where you're at in your notes. And so that's where that dramatic pause came from. Bear with me a second. All right. We're about to move on to our second question this morning. I just want to mention very briefly before we move on in the passage that there are other things that we don't have time to cover this morning. And what that should tell us is we're studying verses 18 to 21 this morning. 18, 19, 20, 21. Four short verses. And I'm going to preach for, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. I don't time myself. And there are things that we're not going to cover this morning. That it just it explode. I, I say this because I want us to see that there is so much depth in God's Word. So let me give you a for instance. It's very interesting to me the illustrations that Jesus chose to use in, this, in these parables. Because most of the time in Scripture, when you see something about leaven, it's bad. Right? Leaven typically symbolizes sin in the Scriptures. And so 1 Corinthians 5, which I mentioned earlier, Paul said, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? The reason he said that was he was talking about the danger of, of unchecked sin in the body of Christ in the church. When a, a scandalous sin was going on, a man was in a, a sexual relationship with his, his stepmother, and the church did nothing. And he's saying, watch out, this is dangerous. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so normally leaven, or take the unleavened bread of the Passover in the book of Exodus, right? That ultimately points to what we did last week, which is the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. Why do we use something unleavened? Because leaven normally symbolizes sin in the Scripture. So why then would Jesus choose to use that as an illustration for the kingdom? It's a good question. And what about the birds of the air? Parable of the soils, we've already covered that in Luke. The birds of the air are agents of the enemy to eat up the seeds so that people won't understand the gospel. So normally, again, a bad thing. And then you've got the other added dimension on there, that that, that is a, a rough quote of something from the Old Testament. My, my point is this, I'm not trying to bore you with the things that I'm saying. I'm just telling you this. Right, we've got four little verses this morning, and we could camp out on those for a long time. When God speaks, it's big, right? And we need to hear what God has to say. And so, again, uh, there's a whole lot there we could cover. I want us to move on to our second question. Second question, why does all this matter? Or as my preaching professor said, a paraphrase of that, so what? right? It's the so what question. Yeah, I get it, Pastor Kevin. Why does this matter? All right, let me give you two reasons. First one, many miss God's kingdom on account of its surprising nature. This is where we look at the context of our passage in Luke's gospel. So what happened earlier in Luke's gospel? This comes on the heels of an incident uh, that we saw a couple weeks ago. Jesus healed a woman who had been afflicted uh, it, was, it was actually demonic, but she had this sickness. She was doubled over in pain for 18 years. Jesus healed her, and, and it was amazing. She, she, whoa, I'm healed! 
She praised God for it. But the problem was, from some people's perspective, that he did it in a synagogue on the Sabbath. Whoa. And the synagogue official, the ruler, the guy that's kind of in charge of the synagogue, he says, hey, it's the Sabbath. You come back and get healed six days and during the week. Don't come on the Sabbath. You remember what I talked about in the sermon uh, was that this guy had a hardened heart. Or, as I called it, religious brick wall syndrome. Right? You ever talk to a brick wall? Try it sometime. Doesn't go very well. And so this guy had a hardened heart. He missed it. He missed the coming of the kingdom. The king of the kingdom is standing right there. And he heard him teach. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what it would be like to hear Jesus teach in the flesh? To be sitting there and hearing the king of kings teaching, preaching. So he heard that, privilege A, for sure. Then he got to see one of the, something that we'll, like in our whole lives, we would love to see something like that. That this woman literally for 18 years is like, oh, oh. And Jesus says, stand up, boom, she stands up, whoa, praise God. And his reaction is, Mm. <sighs> he's angry can you imagine that missed it he missed it now I don't know what specifically he was looking for some of the religious leaders and some of the people undoubtedly were looking for some sort of military intervention that area was under the control of the hated Roman Empire at that point and so they were conflating different texts from the Old Testament, and it may have been that he was looking for something else in the form of this dramatic military leader who would rise up in the place of King David, and he was going to just tear up the Romans and kick them out, get out of here, and that he's looking for, and maybe that's what he was looking for, I don't know, but I can tell you what he was not looking for, an untrained uh, peasant, if you will, a, a carpenter's son from uh, the podunk village of Nazareth in the region of Galilee. He was not looking for that guy to come teaching. Who's that guy to come teaching me and work miracles? That is not what he was looking for. It wasn't impressive to him. That's not impressive. Yeah, I'm waiting for the guy coming on the white horse and he's going to kick out the Romans. What, what, who's this guy? He's not the Messiah. And so he missed the coming of the kingdom. You know, the people often missed it as well. The crowds, well, they liked the miracles a lot of times. The problem was, that was what they thought everything was about. And so Jesus works a miracle, and they're like, that was cool. Show us another one. Give us another one. Give us another miracle. They liked it because they were entertained, or they liked it because they benefited from it. Feeding of the 5,000, John's Gospel. Jesus feeds 5,000, it's actually more than 5,000 people with a few loaves and a couple fish. And what's their reaction? Let's make him king, man. This guy's got the limitless food supply. Yes! That's, they, they, were, they just wanted to fill their stomachs. They're not concerned that this is the king. The real king came to establish a different kind of kingdom, and so they missed it. They didn't understand the suffering servant didn't come to entertain them in a larger sense. He didn't come to feed or heal them. He did those things, but ultimately those things pointed to his identity as the king of the kingdom, which was to come. And people missed it. Totally missed it. It wasn't impressive to them. Jesus came to offer himself as a substitute for sinners, to die on a Roman cross and then to rise from the dead. That is not what they were looking for. And so they missed it. My friend, have you missed it? Have you missed it? Have you got in your head this idea? Maybe you don't even think in those terms about kingdom and whatnot, but you just think, you know what? I'm going to see God move. It's going to be some impressive thing. I'm waiting for some miracle to happen. I'm waiting for the fire to fall or whatever. Don't you guys say stuff like that happened in the Bible? And so we miss what God actually is doing. Right? He's got the mustard seed. 
And it begins to grow into a, a shrub, a, a plant, a tree, large enough that the birds of the air can nest in its branches. It's slow. It's not impressive. It's not dramatic. But it is the power of God that makes it grow. And people miss it. They don't see transformation in people's lives. That's not what you're looking for. You're looking for something spectacular, exciting. But friends, that is not often how God works. Have you missed it? Have you missed the simple gospel message? I, I remember reading several years ago the biography, one of the biographies of Adoniram Judson. He was a first missionary, uh, Christian missionary to Burma, we now know as Myanmar. And it was a very slow, arduous process. He lost uh, multiple wives in the process in sequence, lost children. It was a, a hard thing. He experienced all sorts of just heartache and hardship as he toiled to translate the scriptures into their language and to, to preach the gospel to an unwilling people. At points, he would come back to the United States. He was there usually to raise support or other things. He would come back and he would report. And some people were getting agitated when he would come back. They didn't care for what he would do because when he would come back, he would preach the gospel. And that was pretty much what he did. And they would say, well, why, aren't you going to tell us these amazing stories about all the stuff that's happening over in Burma? What's, what's going on? He says, I just told you the greatest news that ever was. Yeah, but our pastor tells us that every time. Why are we? And there was this standoff in a way because he said, no, you know what? That's the greatest news that ever was. There's nothing. I'm not saying it's wrong to share his experiences. That was his take on it. But he did have a point. This is the greatest news that ever was. And maybe you've heard it a thousand times. Maybe you've heard it 10,000 times. It doesn't change the fact that a loving God, perfectly righteous and holy, that would send his son to die for people who by their nature are his enemies is the greatest news ever told. Greatest news ever. Nothing like it in all the world. Have you missed it, friend? So maybe you're here this morning, you never placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You've never humbled yourself, turned away from your sin, and placed your faith in Jesus. I'd love to talk and pray with you about that after the sermon. Let's get to our second answer. This will kind of be how we start to land the plane. We need to trust the Lord and be faithful when things aren't, quote-unquote, exciting. Watching a seed grow into a tree is not exciting. It's not. No one says, hey, it's Friday night. Well, we could either go see a movie, or we could go out to eat, or we could go watch the tree grow. Pretty sure that one's not going to be on the list, right? It's not exciting. Watching bread rise is not exciting. And nobody's going to pick that either for their activity. Uh, you got your, your, it's summertime still, right? Your kid's home or whatever from school. Like, what are we going to do this week? Well, we might go... Um, we might go swim this week. We might go to uh, this museum over here. And we're going to go play with these kids over here. And then uh, uh, Thursday, we're going to go watch the bread rise. Right. See how that goes with your kids, right? It's not exciting. It's not dramatic. But it is what Jesus says. The kingdom is like that. The growth of God's kingdom takes place over time with lots of stumbles and heartaches along the way. But God is doing something. And in the end, it is glorious. Glorious beyond our imagination. And my friends, our role in the growth of the kingdom is quite limited. God makes it grow. And yet, He does use us in the process. What is our role? I planted, Apollos watered. Right? We work the leaven into the dough, so to speak. We plant gospel seed. Why am I getting on this? Why am I saying this? We need to remember this in our age of spiritual disinterest and apathy. I've told many people this privately. I've probably shared it publicly before. I genuinely believe, based on what I see in our context, that we are at a low spiritual ebb. 
I really believe that. Read, you look at anything around you, I believe we're in a low spiritual ebb. Now, there are exceptions to that, and I don't want it to stay that way. I pray constantly, as does Pastor Mark, that God would do something dramatic to awaken people from their spiritual slumber. He can do it. However, we ultimately have to trust in the sovereignty of God. He put us in a particular time, in a particular place to accomplish His purposes. He chose, not us. Acts chapter 17. Love this passage. Paul preaching in Athens, Mars Hill. The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He's needed anything, since He Himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, catch this, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. You ever think like that? That God actually determined the time and the places that we'll be in our lifetime? It's crazy to think about that. Why did he do that? That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he had fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, capital M, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And that, my friends, is Jesus. Friends, I have seen dramatic times and seasons of kingdom growth. I remember early in my Christian life, I came to Christ in 1998. The late 90s were, uh, uh, God was working in all sorts of powerful ways. Some of you remember Promise Keepers and other things. There were these large ministries that were booming at that time. The college and singles ministry that I was a part of at that stage. It was, it was quite amazing. It grew rapidly. Many people were coming to Christ a number of us ended up in seminary and ultimately in vocational ministry, and I praise God for that. But my friends, that was a particular time, in a particular place, a particular season. As far as I can tell right now, that ministry does not exist anymore, right? God used it for a season. It was wonderful, but God had his purposes in it. Why do I share that? To depress you? Let's just end right there. Everybody go out, let's just be depressed this afternoon. Hopefully you know better than that. No, I'm trying to remind you that sometimes God works in dramatic ways. But quite often he doesn't. Sometimes it's just the small, everyday, faithful ministry of believers, unseen by others, that God uses to build his kingdom. It's the undramatic. It's the faithful sowing of gospel seed. It's the continual persistent working in of the leaven day by day day by day consistent faithfulness and love and God adds to his kingdom one by one one by one one by one he's always doing his work but it may be unseen by us at the moment but God is faithful friends it may even seem boring but in the end the result in glory will be utterly stunning stunning what does that look like well it might be apparent with a stubborn, rebellious child. Continually praying for that son or daughter, all the while teaching and modeling the gospel. Tears shed over this child. My friends, it's easy to lose faith in a situation like that. You're thinking, ah, oh, God, are you ever going to do anything? And then one day the child, who may even be grown up now, comes to faith. My friends, all that gospel exposure did make a difference. Or maybe someone's faithful dealings alongside a coworker, day in, day out, showing up with integrity, doing your job, pointing to Jesus, showing compassion, praying for someone who's hurting, caring for others. Day by day, it seems like, well, is anything going to happen with this? Years later, the Christian learns that the former coworker now uh, is now a brother or sister in Jesus. My friends, God does work like that. Or it could be a, a believer showing neighbor love to somebody who 
by all outward appearances, is quite unlovable. And that faithful Christ follower continually points to the Savior, prays for this person. It seems pointless at the time, but it isn't, my friends. It honors Jesus, and in his kindness, he uses that faithfulness to break down walls in the unbeliever's heart. And then one day, that difficult, unpleasant person realizes that Jesus really does save wretched sinners and surrenders his or her life to Jesus. My friends, that type of stuff does happen. God does work. The long view. Lots of other scenarios could be described. My friends, God uses the everyday lives of Christ followers in every age to make an impact for his kingdom, to grow it. So don't be discouraged, friend. Be faithful. That is the call. Be faithful. Trust God and be patient. Remind yourself that God is at work. We may not see it right away. We may not see the the seed, boom, grow up immediately. But that consistent faithfulness, persistence, God uses that. Unseen forces, God's working in someone's heart and life. And ultimately, God is glorified in that. The every day. It's like we've conditioned ourselves to almost be find that repulsive everyday faithfulness that's what you're getting at in this message i thought you were going to have some exciting thing you know what when god's at work it's exciting it just may not be immediately evident to us in that way but i promise you that in the end it's going to be more exciting than anything you've ever experienced you think about what it's going to be like in glory to see what god has done to see the impact that God has made through everyday faithful brothers and sisters in Jesus, faithfully being ambassadors for Jesus in this world. And we're going to, all the saints, all those who are in Christ, gather together around the throne, joining their voices in praise to the God of the universe. That is the most glorious experience ever. Nothing like it. Joining their voices together to praise their Creator. And the reason that is possible is because God worked in all these different ways that were unseen, unimpressive, not dramatic, slow, long period of time. History unfolded. Our own lives unfold. And God is at work. Praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. So be encouraged, friend. Don't be discouraged by our low-ebb spiritual age. Don't be discouraged by the things you watch on TV, the things you see in the workplace, the things you see in school, the things that you... All those things can be crushing if we focus on those things, but if we remember that God is at work. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, my friend, our labors are not in vain. They're not in vain. They're not in vain. We don't have this one on the screen. I'm going to close with that verse this morning and then we'll pray. At the very end of 1 Corinthians 15, probably heard it read in some context before, the Apostle Paul's teaching about the resurrection And he's encouraging the church there at Corinth. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain. God will grow his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the ordinary, from our perspective, ways that you have worked in our lives, many of which we probably don't even know. We have no idea. If we could see from your perspective and see all of the the various ways, the people that have spoken to us of Jesus, the Sunday school teachers who faithfully shared with us, a parent 
who prayed with us, a, a stranger, a coworker, uh, even supplying your word so freely to us. We have such access to your word, so many different things, Christian uh, radio or uh, TV, a sermon or something. We use so many different means, many of which are just pedestrian. They're, they're not super appealing to many. And yet it is through these things that you sow gospel seed in hardened hearts and you break that hardness and you transform sinners into saints. You forgive, you restore, and you give hope, the hope of eternal life. And one day all who are in Christ will gather around your throne and praise you. What a glorious picture. People from every tribe, tongue, nation. What a glorious truth. So God, would you strengthen us in the everyday Christian life, most of which takes place outside the walls of this building. Wherever we find ourselves on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, by your Spirit, would you empower us to be faithful in our labors for your kingdom that you will then use to grow your kingdom just like you grow the mustard seed into a tree and you grow the bread into a, a rising lump of dough from the, the leaven. And for all these things, May you be glorified, all for you, in Christ's name, amen.